What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the 585 Report. Mitch Broder alongside Ryan Sullivan. It's Victory Monday. The Bills are coming off a win, which feels good, considering that the kind of last taste we had in our mouths was from that Titans loss. It was also the trade deadline tonight, um, although this is dropping on Wednesday or on YouTube. Saturday, we do record on Tuesday night, so trade deadline came and went. We'll definitely get into some of that discussion, but uh, a lot to talk about. Uh, Ryan, as we kind of head into the middle of the season now and, uh, you know, good win for the Bills. We'll, we'll see what they can build off of this. Yeah, I mean, it definitely, I think Greg Thompson said that the Bills lead the league in games where you cover and still feel like shit after it because the Bills, they covered and, but it was ugly and there's, you know, we, we talked about offline in the first few games when the Bills were beating everyone by 20 and everything was great. There wasn't a ton to talk about. So at least from a content perspective, there's a lot to kind of unpack from this game because this was, a, a at least in the first half, was was not pretty and not looking good for the Bills. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this game, I, I, I you know, I, I, Nick Geary had a tweet about this, and I think it really kind of was a perfect way to put it. You know, he's like, you know, the Bills have played the Dolphins twice. Right. And fans have been upset with what they saw on the field. Yet the Bills have outscored the Dolphins, those two games, 61 to 11. You know, it's just like this is where we're at, like as a team where, you know, you outscore someone 61 to 11 and fans are still, you know, think we could it could have been more, could have been better. So that's why I feel like, you know, this game, although, yes, there are definitely a few concerning things. One concerning factor in particular, I'm sure you and me agree the same, you know, the same opinion on. Um, you know, but overall, like, I, I feel like the one thing, I mean, before we can, I mean, the Bills, you know, they at least did turn things around. They got it together. That second half, they the game went about how I think we expected it to go, which was kind of Buffalo in control. But you're right, Ryan. The first half was really kind of rocky. Um, and I guess we can kind of get right into it. I mean, f- I, I feel like I know what you're going to say here, but for, going, for talking about what went wrong on Sunday, you know, what is one thing in your mind that really kind of went went uh, downhill for Buffalo this past week. I think so. I I made it a point this week that I'm going to defend Brian Dable because there's a lot of chatter online that Brian Dable's bad or this offense is bad. And I want to get out in front and say that is just not true. Brian Dable is still good at his job, that he's coaching a top 10 offense, a number one scoring offense, a number six in yards per game offense. This offense is fine. His coaching is fine. There's times like today and throughout the season where sometimes he does things that are curious. And I think the case that was the case in the first half of this game today. And I I think the anger and the frustration was a little overblown. There was maybe four or five plays that I didn't like in this game. There was two or three different second and long runs that I think running on second and long analytically, mathematically, however you want to look at it, common sense is not a smart way. It's not, not a smart way of playing football. And, and Ben Baldwin came out with one of his graphs today that showed Buffalo is one of the, uh, now one of the teams that run on second and long the most, which is really weird. So that's something I'd like to see him get out of, but that was really frustrating. The second, the third and nine run with Josh Allen was really frustrating uh, in this game. But a lot of in that first half was execution. You know, they shifted the, you know, something that I guess we didn't talk about enough going into the game was how they would shift that offensive line. Cause it wasn't, they didn't just replace Spencer Brown. They kicked Darrell Williams back out. They flipped the side of the line, John Feliciano's on and they put it like Bakker. So really that's three changes that went on, even though Darrell Williams has played a lot of tackle before and Feliciano's played both sides of the line. That's a lot of change to go into a game, even off a of bye week. So there was a lot of issues on that line early on. There was a lot of plays with Allen had pressure in his face. There was a lot of plays where there was just, when they did run, the, the one play that sticks out to me, the third and two run where they tried, I, I don't know if it's outside zone or whatever technique you want to call it, but the third and two run, the Moss, where they tried to get outside and Feliciano just got blown back into Moss. That's a play if you're an if you're a good NFL offense, you need to be able to run and, and successfully uh, complete and they didn't because of got the, the the ineffectiveness of this offensive line so th- there was issues 
there were some issues I, I will give. There, there, it seemed like into this game in the first half, the Bills, their game plan was that they wanted to control the game on the ground. They wanted to get the run game going like it was in the first half, in the first game that they played where they opened that game up with a 40-yard run from Devin Singletary. And it wasn't there, and it seemed like they tried to push that just a little bit too long. And that's a reasonable, that's reasonable. But I think it's also reasonable that to, to we have to recognize that there was a lot of execution issues in that first half as well. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the criticism of Brian Dable is frankly kind of ridiculous. I mean, just what I mean, look from this past, you know, Sunday night, Monday night game, you know, when you look at the Vikings and the Giants, I mean, you want to look at how bad play calling can get and how you know, backwards can be, you know, watch Jason Garrett and Mike Zimmer run an offense. I mean, sure, Brian Dable, I agree with you. I don't know why he went away from what worked so well in this offense a year ago, which was just passing on early downs. I get that the Bills want to be better running the football, but frankly, what we've seen so far through seven games, I mean, if you're if you were part of that crowd of run the football more, I think that, you know, you're kind of looking a little silly right now because the Bills have been running the ball more, and guess what? The results aren't really any different from what we saw a year ago when they barely ran the football. And for for an offense that's so much better when Allen's in rhythm and they're and they're and they're able to kind of hit, you know, you know, and the intermediate and the short and the like the deep and really just get Allen going, get those receivers going, like we saw in that second half. Um, you know, the offense looks totally different. So I do agree with you. I think that was more of an execution problem rather than Brian Dayball play calling, although I do agree I didn't love the game he called. I don't think it's the worst game he's called by any means, and it's not 2019 Bill's bad, um, but it was a little di- a little weird. But, I mean, when you talk about execution, I think the big, I mean, the biggest thing for me as far as execution that stands out is the interior offensive line play that the Bills had on Sunday. I mean, it was horrible. Plain and simple, the O-line was bad, and yes, they did have to shift some things, and, you know, that that's definitely something you don't want to do halfway through the season. But what kind of concerned me was at the end of the day, the the lineup they had on the field, which left to right was Dawkins, Bucker, Morse, Feliciano, and Darrell Williams. I mean, that was your starting offensive lineman, you know, that, that group last season when they made that deep playoff run. And yet those guys are that same group who do know each other well and played each other last year, you know, struggled as bad as they did. And I mean, I don't want to take too much thunder away away from you, Ryan, because I know you've been banging the table about this player since March, but let's be honest. I mean, John Feliciano has been a disaster this season. There was three or four times in that game where I, in the first watch, watching it live, where either I saw a guy going past John Feliciano, I saw John Felicio having to turn around chasing a guy that got by him, John Felicio on the ground, Feliciano on the ground because he got knocked down. He almost lost me money because he did a nonsensical cut, uh, chop block late in the fourth quarter when the play was nowhere near him and they got second and 25. I do not want to see this man on the damn offensive line again the rest of this season. He... He had, he was fine in 2019. He did he was able to do what was asked him, but he's been on a steady regression ever since then. And it's it's just it's mind numbing that this is where we are with this team and where we are with it. And you know, it, I think it's a fallacy. You know, I, I used to be one of those people. Well, it can't get any worse. Start Joe Douglas or Jamil Douglas. You know, it can always get worse. It's a fallacy. It, it can absolutely get worse. But at this point. There has to be something that you try. I don't know what the answer is, but there has to be something. Ryan Bates has been on this team for three or four years. Maybe you give him a shot on this line and let him see if he can do it. They obviously see something in Ryan Bates that they like or they wouldn't have kept him around this long. You know, I, I Bacher, it, he seemed like the lesser of two evils. Maybe keep giving him some more run out there. I don't know what it is. We'll talk about the lack of action in the trade deadline here in a, in a few minutes, but it's the bills have to find something to do with that offensive line. And I, I will take the foot off the gas a little bit, you know, it not be present moment. The offensive line as a whole hasn't been as bad as I think even I make it sound sometimes or Twitter make it sound. But when you put, you know, they're about, if you look at pass rush win rate and you look at pressure or excuse me, pass block win rate, and run block win rate and and pressures on Josh and sacks on Josh. It's about a middle of the pack offensive line, which 
but when you put it on, when you compare it to the rest of the team, it is the absolute biggest liability going forward. And the uh, Robbie Johnson or Bobby Johnson and, and Dable are going to have to find a way to scheme around it or fix it in the next 10 weeks here. The, the way I've kind of looked at the, the, the interior offensive line, right? I'll be honest. I actually think when Spencer Brown's out there and they put Darren Williams inside, I think that those two on the right side ultimately do fine. When I'm looking at Ford, uh, Feliciano, and Bucker, I kind of look at it. I'm not saying that, that any one of those three is necessarily some big upgrade here or anything like that. Um, I'm more looking at it as, you know, okay, if Cody Ford's in the game, you know he's getting burnt. He's probably giving up at least three or four or five pressures, and that's a, or that's a problem. If you have Fleece Yon in there, you know you're at least getting two, three penalties easily out of him. That's a problem, at least with Bucker. I'm not saying that Ike Bucker is this great guard. He is at best average. But at least with him, when he's out there, he doesn't do anything stupid. You know, he doesn't make any critical mistakes. Is he going to make some great block and spring a huge run? Probably not. But is he at least going to, like, not get penalties and not – kill you and put you in positions, you know, way behind the chains, you know, for the most part. Yeah. So I, he I does, agree. He, does, he doesn't play active defense against your offense. Exactly. He doesn't shoot them in the foot. Now I agree with you. I'd like to see what Ryan Bates can do. Uh, he's, I mean, I, every time he plays, although limited, I've been impressed with him. I think he does actually, you know, has shown he can play at a decent high, you know, at a decent level here, but he's that backup center. And I guess they just don't want to expose him out at guard and and I, but yeah the 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 offensive guard position on this team has become a real I think Achilles heel and especially when what we've seen if Dawkins or Brown get hurt and they have to move Williams out to tackle it really exposes them big time yeah I mean yeah this offensive line is really one more injury away from being in a really bad spot and you know we can hope we've been really fortunate that Dawkins isn't a guy, knock on wood, that doesn't get hurt. And Daryl Williams is, is a guy with injury history, but has stayed healthy through two seasons here. So it, it you know, the, there's not much more harp on that. Just it, it's got to get better if they, because there's teams that can exploit way, when they get into the playoffs. But let's talk about something good here in this game. And, and we talked about Brian Dable's play calling and we can sit here and we can complain about how bad it was. And I, let's not undermine it because you know, I, it got hot in the BF family chat, the glitchy behind the scenes during the game, because it, it is inexcusable for this offense to give up three points. I don't want to come off as everything's fine and dandy guy here. It, it is inexcusable to put up three points against Miami and a half. If you are a Super Bowl contending team, but it's football. Shit happens. And, and I keep going back to, to the baseball analogy with a, with a starting pitcher. What makes an ace? What makes a really good starting pitcher? They have their A stuff. Their really good stuff. 50% of the time, 60% of the time. The other 50, 40% of the time, you're going to have your B stuff, your C stuff. And what separates Clayton Kershaw from a run-of-the-mill 5 ERA pitcher is being able to figure it out and get the job done when you don't have your A stuff. And Dable, when his game, it took him a little bit longer than we would have liked. It got a little bit more uncomfortable than it should have. But once he figured that out, and once he's a, once he did adjust in the second half, he went on four straight scoring drives. Touchdown, touchdown, field goal. Granted, the last one was a very short field. But touchdown. And they had absolutely no answer once they adjusted. They had no answer for Beasley. They had no answer for Josh. And there was just nothing Miami could do in the second half to stop Buffalo. So there was an adjustment. He didn't get set in his plans. And I think that is an upside to take from this game. Yeah, I mean, like you said, that that first half was awful. I mean, I, I, there's no other way to put it from the offense. They were they, that was unacceptable how poorly they played in that first half. But I think a few things. I think one, you do have to give some credit to Miami because they did come to play. I mean, yes, they still ended up losing by two, you know, two, excuse me, two scores. But they came that first half playing with you know with, their, with that, especially that defense. I mean, they were playing hard. They did make a couple plays, and I think you do have to kind of give them a little credit because at the end of the day, it's a divisional opponent. You know, 
things like this happen with these in, with these individual games because the teams know each other so well. So I'm not saying that I just pass it off as nothing for the Bills, but I don't think it was just simply the Bills played like you know like shit for a half. I think there was a few other things going into it, just like you know like the Dolphins playing well. But the thing that I like that I saw from that second half is because it, it's kind of like a little bit what we saw from the Chiefs when they went on that Super Bowl run, right? Where they could be down in a game and they could be playing like crap for two and a half, three quarters, but they can just get hot out of nowhere and just start rattling points on a defense and still win the game. And what we saw is that this offense has that capabilities that they could be cold for 20 minutes in a game, right? Or 35 minutes into a game. And then all of a sudden they can score on, you know, four, five, six straight possessions. So I do think that, you, you know, fans should at least be happy to see that this that this offense can kind of go from being completely flat and cold to really kicking it in high gear and putting up points. Because again, that's what they did on Sunday. I mean, they again they they only played a good quarter and a half of football, but that quarter and a half they were playing some top level offense. And maybe this is a correlation. Does it mean causation thing? I don't know. I'll have to ask uh, Clay or Kendall this question or or watch their Thursday film review, which if you're, I, me, at least me, I'm not, I don't have the eye for film. If, if you're someone who likes to see people who know they're talking about breakdown film, uh, Clay and Clay and Kendall every Thursday, I think it's at like six on the Buffalo Fanatics channel to go watch that plug. Um, But anyways, my point, what I was saying was I almost got lost there. In the second half, once they started throwing the ball and once they let, because Josh did end up with 42 passes and, with not a terrible stat line, 250 yards through the air, 300 total yards, 69% completion percentage, three total touchdowns. Wasn't a bad day for Josh. But once they started throwing it downfield, and once he got in rhythm, and once he started hitting his passes, the run game opened up. They started getting more run. They got a little bit more chunk plays out of Moss and Singletary. And it's funny how that works. I don't know if that's just Miami getting tired and lazy or whether there's something to that, whether the Bills passing game opening up and and forcing teams to maybe play a little bit lighter boxes and playing a little bit deeper allows them to run more effectively. I know the old adage is you establish the run so you can throw, but maybe the Bills need to establish the throw so they can run the ball. Maybe that's just where they are with this team. Because at this moment, you know, I, I think they need to lean into what they are. And this is a team that passes. And, you know, Joe Marino said it, Judge said it. Every time you hand off the ball, especially to these two running backs, who I think are fine running backs, you're taking the ball out of Josh Allen's hands. And this offense, time and time and time and time again, proves it is most effective when you just give Josh the ball and say, go do something. And he proved it in that second half. He was running all over them. He was he was hitting the pass he needed to pass. So it really, really just effective fun offense in the second half. And Welcome back defense after that Tennessee game, man. That defense, it, we, we talked, you know, Tua, Tua didn't play that bad. He, I think mm-hmm. he did a lot of the things that we talked about in the, in our show last week where he did, he hit a couple of some nice, pretty balls to Devontae Parker. Devontae Parker's a good receiver who, you know, I don't blame Levi Wallace for getting bodied by, by Devontae Parker because Devontae Parker's really good at those type of plays. That's why, that's where Devontae Parker makes his living. He's that power forward type receiver that can go up and high point a ball like that. You know, it, it, it happens. It's like, it's like being, mm-hmm. being a cornerback. It's like being a hockey goalie. Every once in a while, you're going to get beat. And that's just part of the position. No one, unless you're, uh, what is it? Oh, nine, oh, 10 Darrell Revis. No one's going to have a perfect game all the time. So, it, but the defense would have been a big way. They were in the backfield. And I, I don't think, I don't can't remember off the top of my head how many sacks they got or if they got any, but they were into his face a bunch and they held it. And this, in the two Miami matchups, Miami didn't get a touchdown for seven quarters. For seven quarters of the eight quarters the the Bills and the Dolphins played, Miami couldn't register a touchdown on this offense. And it, and when it came down and they had to get a stop, they did. And so the defense is back. If you had concerns, and once again, Miami's defense isn't super electric, but back and ju- just really putting their throats on people. So that was really fun. And I think comforting to see as well, coming off a, a game in which we kind of uh, got brought down, uh, brought down a rung, at least uh, emotionally. Yeah. Defense got their swagger back. You know, we talked about it last show, get the swagger back and they did. 
And I, I mean, I talk about the defense. I mean, a couple of players, I think, you know, I want to give a quick shout out to for how well they played. First of all, Ed Oliver. I mean, yes, I know that this Miami offensive line is a pretty awful line they're among one of the worst in football but did, did you see the play where the offensive guard just, just didn't run by you <laughs> yeah didn't even touch him i mean that that i can't really give Ed oliver too much credit for that one because i think i could have maybe caused a pressure if i was lined up there but uh no but ed oliver i mean i know the stat sheet wasn't as crazy frankly it should have been a pretty good stat sheet for him he should have had a sack and a, and a fumble recovery in this game but um you know got the sack called back because hughes was off sides and then somehow that fumble you know squirted out of out of his arms i don't know how but point being is though ed oliver i think has actually been one of the best players in this defense this season although he's not maybe getting the sacks and tackles he is just causing pressures he's really he's been amazing against the run this season honestly i i was really impressed with i saw from him and then uh poyer was just uh, i mean he's you know at some point he's gonna have to get in the pro bowl right i mean it's it, it's getting kind of ridiculous i mean he's having a great season honestly he's having i think his best season maybe ever as a bill th- through seven games i uh, had another pick and led the team to tackles uh he had 10 tackles in this game so he was terrific and then also tradavius white i know that you know we all know trey white is an elite shutdown corner but because he never gets the ball thrown his direction i feel like we often don't talk about tradavius white because there's nothing to talk about they just didn't target him and i just noticed in the miami game he wasn't targeted at too many times i think maybe five or six times but he, you know, he broke up a couple passes. He made some good tackles. You know, he's a guy that you sometimes, again, you forget how great he is. And then once, you know, he makes a few plays, you're like, yep, that's, you know, that's why they're paying him what they're paying him. So defense, like you said, Ryan, was right on track. I mean, yes, this Miami offense is limited. They're not that explosive. They're not really that good, uh, to be honest. But they were playing real focused. And uh, it was good to see them return to the form that we believe they are, which is, you know, a top 10 defense in the National Football League. It's so funny with this defense because it, you go into every game, you're like, oh, well, that guy played a good game. He didn't, we don't have talked about him much. Oh, he also played a good game. He doesn't, like, everyone, this is, uh, everyone on this team just kind of plays good all the time as opposed to, like, Vernon Butler. Like, right. everyone on this defense does a good job. And from, from Levi Wallace to Justin Zimmer, who I know wasn't active in this game, but you know, to, to Greg Rousseau and everyone just kind of does what's asked of them. And, you know, Robert Mays and, and Nate Tice, they do a really good job of kind of summing up the Bills defense because the Bills defense is one of these defenses. that's not like a, it's not like a, a Rams defense last year with it's not like a Brandon Staley defense, or it's not like one of these defenses that, that are going to shift a whole lot or going to kind of going to try to trick you or going to try to give you these really funky looks. The Bills defense just, they come out in, you know, base nickel looks. And if you want to beat them, you're going to have to beat them. And and they, they're they not going to beat themselves. So you're, and it it's really impressive to watch the way they they do it. So before we get into kind of the, the deadline talk or the lack of deadline talk, how do you, I think after wins like this, we, we always talk about, you know, the, the debate, a win's a win versus, you know, the, the way you win is more predictive than winning itself. And I think that, I think that's absolutely true. So, but at the end of the day, it, a win is a win in this league. Cause it's, it's such a, I'm going to say weak in this, or I'm going to say win in this line in this sentence like nine times, but it is a week to week league and you see all types of stuff happen in this week specifically so how do you feel after this win does this win make you feel icky is there do you is do you just forget about this move on how do you feel about this win you know it it, it's it's tough to say ryan because they ended up winning and the finals i mean listen they won they covered they took care of business i i think overall like i do feel for the most part pretty good about this win i think is how i put it i think that the defense was great the offense made some big um adjustments in the second half which was good to see obviously listen josh allen sure the stat line wasn't incredible but listen it was another great game from him and we know what he's about and also it was great to see cole beasley really be a part of the offense he's been kind of quiet this season um 
I mean, honestly, I kind of just you know the only the only the only thing that makes me feel bad and shitty about this game is just the is just the offensive line. That's really it. If the O line didn't have the game they had, I really don't think anyone would feel too bad about this game because I do think they were a big reason why they didn't execute in that first half and why that first half went went the way they did because they couldn't run block, they couldn't pass protect Allen. Um, so. I, I feel for the most part pretty good. Would have would I obviously have liked to see more? Yeah, I would have loved to see them just go and dominate the Dolphins, you know, 35 to nothing again. Um, but as you said, this is the NFL. Things happen. Those are professionals on the other side of the ball, too. Um, so overall, I, I don't feel too bad about this about this win. I think the Bills, you know, maybe were a little rusty coming off the bye, but I don't I, I'm not that concerned. I, I don't I know about wanna, you. I want to give validation one more time to the people that it is reasonably frustrated with the first half and they can't have that again. Oh yeah. But the, but you know, I think what makes this team special is that if they do start like that, this defense is going to keep them in football games. So if they have games where the offense might be off to a slow start, they have the defense to keep them in the football games, really true complimentary football. But I, I tweeted this out from the show account this week. When you look at stuff that goes around the NFL on a weekly basis, and you look at the rest of the, specifically the AFC, which is turning out to not be great, and you have things like Cincinnati, who last week beat the doors off Baltimore, get beat by Mike White and the Jets, <laughs> and go for 400 yards on what we thought was a good defense. When you see stuff like Tre- the Trevor Simeon Saints beating. Tom Brady and the Buccaneers when you when you see when you have games where the Jets beat Tennessee and being able to win like I said when when you're not playing your best football shows how good of a team you are and being able to win by 15 when they didn't play a great game is I, I think it shows a lot about what this team is and and now that we're here on Tuesday, you know, Derrick Henry is now out for the season. There's no one in Buffalo's way for a Super Bowl now. The, the go to the Super Bowl at the minimum. Buffalo is the team. Without Derrick Henry, I don't think Tennessee is that team. So it, I, I still feel really good about where we stand in the division. And before we move on to the deadline, we also got a new, it feels like every game or at least every few games, Josh gives us a new gift. And, you know, a couple of <laughs> yeah. no, cu- couple weeks ago it was jumping over. It was jumping over Kansas City. And now we got, I think it's, I think that is my all time favorite gift now, at least until the next one comes out. Josh waving goodbye to Christian Wilkins that I, I'm going to use that liberally for the rest of the year. Cause that is, I, it, I love that stuff. So it, that, that, if anything, if nothing else, we got great, <laughs> we got great memeage out of this game. No, dude, I I love Petty Josh. I that is my favorite Josh Allen when he when he is fired up and he doesn't give a damn. When, when he waves goodbye, I laughed out loud watching the game. I thought that it was so great. Um, and it's funny too because like you know, even though the Dolphins are struggling and not having a bad season, it does feel like there's a little bit of bad blood between these teams. You know, I remember Josh's rookie year. I think it was like against the Dolphins, they tried to take a cheap shot on him. And I think Jordan Mills ended up like thrown out of the game for you know fighting you know protecting Josh Allen uh, last year. If I were you know obviously we we you know run it up ran it up on them 56 26 and they're battling for their playoff lives. So I listen I love that and I love that immediately after the game you know there was gif there was videos of it it's already just been memed to the to the max. So I'm listen I'm all for it I I love that. Real quick did you watch the this was not in our show notes did you watch the Josh Allen Manning cast last night? So I watched a little bit of it. I was so I was watching the game with uh, two friends of mine who are Giants fans. So they did kind of want to watch the regular broadcast, but I've watched most of the Manning cast. I was able to like find like clips of it all over YouTube. So I've I've gotten a, a chunk of it, but uh, it was great, man. I mean, listen, Josh Allen, I thought was about what he said he was going to be, but he was still. I mean, listen, it's still Josh. I, I can still listen to him talk forever. I, even more so, you know, e- even though he was boring, even more so than. Peyton Manning's kid being his favorite. Uh, <laughs> right. He, he, him but his last name on his jersey. Kid, even yeah. more so than that, I think what we got out of it for me was drunk Josh Allen getting tricked by Chad Henney into thinking he was uh, Pat Mahomes' quarterback coach. I think that's what that's what I got oh, yeah. out of. That's what I got out of it. But <laughs> not not to not to go on a segue. But I, I just, literally just thought about that as I was sitting here. 
Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And it's funny too, Allen was like talking about like, oh, I don't think I'm going to be in the Manning cast. And then sure enough, like two days later, it's like, yeah, Josh Allen's on the Manning cast. <laughs> but anyways, before we kind of like talk at a deadline real quick, who's your gold star? Who's your LVP as oh. we kind of wrap up uh, oh. this this Dolphins review here? All right. So my, my gold star is uh, I went back and forth with this one. I, I have them both down. But I always I always say I felt I said Josh like two times this week, so I'm not gonna say him. I'm gonna say Tyler Bass because we haven't given him a ton of love. And not just for this game, just in general. First of all, that 57 yard field goal, holy crap, man. What, yeah, what that, a kick. That that would have been good from 65. It like he he god damn, like dude's got a leg. And he's really he's it, just to give you a stat on the year now, he's 16 of 17. He is his only misses was a fifty was a fifty plus yarder. He's two of two from forty, four of four from thirty, and eight of eight from twenty plus. Hasn't mixed an extra point. And I always get a little nervous with kickers, so I'm not gonna say I'm never nervous because I'm just always nervous with kickers. But it's nice just have a guy that it it's like ha- it's like having Clay Thompson on your team or Steph Curry. You can just pull up from every anywhere and kick it. And I'm waiting for the day. I'm waiting for the day at the end of a half where McDermott lets him go out for a 65 yard field goal. Cause I really think given the chance he can hit uh, a Justin Tucker distanced field goal. No, absolutely. I, 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 I agree. I think that, you know, Tyler Bass at this point, I think he might be a top five kicker in the NFL. I mean, he's been tr- amazing for the bills. And honestly, this, this might be crazy to say, I'm not saying he is their best draft pick, but he might be one of Brandon Bean's best like one of the best picks he's had in the, I mean, in the last couple of years, I mean, the guy led the league in scoring as a rookie. He's been automatic. And just because there's so many kicker problems across the NFL on so many different teams to know that like you have a guy who's young, who is already terrific. And that, you know, is going to pretty much be on your team for the next 15 years. I mean, what, what, like what a great find that was in the sixth round. I mean, if you want to just go be and exclude the 2017 draft, that was technically, Whaley and you just want to go 2018 and up. I mean, after Josh and, and Edmonds, like, like is he, the sec- is he, is he the second? And one other thing that I've just noticed, not to not spend too much long, too much longer in this game, but one other thing I've noticed is that he can do what he was doing. I, I don't think we talked about it after the KC game, but I noticed it in this game when they got that 15 yard, uh, 15 yard foul after the touchdown, well, it was after the game Davis touchdown, where he gets hit on the head mm-hmm. and he uh gonna get the 15 yards on the kickoff. He doesn't boot it out of the end zone. He's able to get it up in the yeah, air. He pops so the sucker it, way up. He pops the sucker up. It's able to get to only gets to the two or three yard line, and they end up tackling because it's such a short kickoff, they end up tackling him at the at the I think it was a 19 yard line. And I noticed that a bunch in I think it was the Kansas City game where he just kept booting it short and they kept tackling him in like it's, you know, four yards there, three yards here that they're getting him short of the 25. But, I mean, that kind of stuff adds up. So, we haven't given Tyler, haven't talked about Tyler Bass a lot. So, what's your gold star player? For me, I talked about him earlier, but I'm going to give it to Ed Oliver um, just because I think he's starting to really kind of come into his own a little bit. Again, yes, the stats have not been there, but if you watch the game closely and you really just pay attention to Ed Oliver for a couple plays, you see how disruptive he is, how he is such a problem for you know the offensive linemen to deal with with his quickness and his power um he was a great i mean i think that yesterday or excuse me i think this past sunday was his best game we've seen him play in the pros uh so for me he's getting my uh my gold star i think the lvp in this game we probably have the same person written down um but again i'll let you uh take it away but i i, I have a feeling we worked on the same the same uh, yeah we, we the same guy we definitely both wrote down John Feliciano. So I'm gonna, oh yeah, oh I'm gonna, absolutely. I'm gonna save my. I've already went on a John Feliciano rant, so I'm gonna lay off right. it, and I'm just gonna go off the top of my head here since we've already talked a lot about John Feliciano, and I'm gonna say I'm getting real freaking tired of Matt Hawk. I understand. Oh, yeah. I understand that Corey Bohorquez can't hold a football, um, and that was a pretty big issue. So I, I don't necessarily have issue with. Corey Borges leaving like other people do it because also apparently Mason Crosby, according to Greg Thompson, apparently Mason Crosby's also super pissed at Corey Borges for holding the football wrong. So I'm not that upset about leaving Borges, but man, like, can you take a little bit less time to kick the football and not like we we talk about Borges's inconsistency? He just is consistent. He he kicked the ball 19 yards 
on the game. And I'm getting yep. real tired. I'm getting real tired of him. And I, I wouldn't be super upset if we use a draft pick on a punter this year. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm really tired of, of seeing Matt Hawk on this team. Oh yeah. I mean, thankfully the bills are not a team that punt often. So luckily he's not someone we see often, but I agree with you. I mean, he, he, you know, he, he's, he's had a couple just really horrific shanks. Um, so I, I agree. He's somebody that's now become on my radar as uh, keep an eye out for him because I, I think he, I mean, we are, he already, you know, hurt them that Steelers game with that blocked punt. So yeah, he's, he's going to, you know, that's a, that's a guy that definitely um, is not playing great right now. Um, but as we talked about though, with this trade deadline, as we kind of transition here, you know, the deadline kind of came and went uh, pretty disappointing, really no moves across the entire NFL outside of, you know, Von Miller obviously getting traded to the Rams and uh, uh, Tardif and the Chiefs getting traded to the Jets. But otherwise, it was very quiet. I guess, like, Ryan, you know, were you upset to see the Bills not make a move? Was there a position you really, like, wanted to see them address? What are your kind of your thoughts on on this trade deadline as Brandon Bean kind of just stood pat? So I'm, I'm going to see how I can organize these thoughts coherently. I want to... I think we're spoiled. We talked offline about this right before we went on, on air that we're spoiled by trade deadlines in other sports. Baseball is a hectic trade deadline. NBA. I, I know I watch more NBA trade deadline content than I actually do at NBA basketball games during the regular season. NFL isn't really known for being a trade deadline. Isn't known for being a super hectic day. Every once in a week, every few years you might get a couple trades, but it's not and up until the, the past couple of years trading in the NFL was super rare as it is. So it, this is still a relatively new thing in terms of the way NFL teams operate. So that's part one uh, of my monologue. Part two is if you're upset with this offensive line, like I think most people are, don't be upset. They didn't make a move now. Be upset. They didn't make a move 10 months ago in the off season. Be mad about that. Don't be mad about this right now because you need two teams to make a trade. They could have signed someone. Creed Humphreys, who they could have drafted, uh, just had the highest draft grade, had the highest PFF grade of the of the week for Kansas City against a really good Giants defensive line. So if you want to be upset about the lack of action, be frustrated with last year because it takes two teams to make a trade. And, you know, we, we talked about Andrew Norwell. And does, does, did, do you think Jacksonville wanted to get rid of someone who is keeping their number one overall pick upright? Probably not. You know, we could talk about some of the guys. I forgot, uh, Flowers in Washington. We kind of about some of the other guys, but it takes two to trade. And we don't know what these teams are asking. We don't know what it would have taken. And I see people that say, well, you got to be aggressive. You got to, you know, look at, look at the Rams. Well, the Rams are going to have no draft picks for the next seven years with the way they handle their draft picks. And, that's a way you can do it. That the, if you want, if you want to have one draft pick a year for the next seven years, cool. But that's not the way this team operates, and they want to keep those draft picks. That's how they think they keep this window open. And that's in making a bad trade. If they, let's say, they did get Andrew Norwell, but they traded a bunch of picks, or they had a, a massive contract that ended up becoming a really bad contract down the line, and the Bills don't win a Super Bowl this year then that's even more frustrating. When Bruce came on uh, this summer, he said, you can't be a Super Bowl or bust and also believe in any given Sunday. It's about keeping your window open as long as you can. So it doesn't frustrate me that they didn't because I know that they were working the phone lines. They were trying. It was reported they were in on Von Miller. So I'm not that off put by it because it. I understand that how they value draft picks and how they value their assets i'm just more frustrated that it took to this point to to try to make those moves and they didn't try to make them in the offseason we were talking about it offline how with brandon bean he, people act like he's this you know crazy you know being after dark he makes these crazy trades and all this stuff and frankly if you look back at it brandon bean he does it's not like he trades a ton, but when he trades, it's very it's very um calculated, it's very thought through completely, right? 
he doesn't just throw around draft picks like we're seeing, you know, less need with the Rams. Just like you said, I mean, they had, they literally have, I think, two draft picks right now for 2022. I mean, they I mean, that, that's it. Um, and Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott mentioned it when they first got hired in Buffalo. It's, it's we're about winning now and winning in the future. And you don't win in the future by just throwing away picks for one-year rentals. Now, granted... Listen, if you win a Super Bowl, are, are those moves worth it? Sure. But as you mentioned, Ryan, as things are for this team, which, of course, they're not a perfect football team. Frankly, no one in the NFL is perfect in all levels on every side of the ball. But with the AFC how it is, with the Bills with a pretty good-looking clear path that one seed, this team, despite making no moves in the, tra- in, uh, the trade deadline, still has got themselves a very good chance of going to the Super Bowl. So I agree with you as much as I think it would have been nice to see the Bills, you know, bring in a, you know, a Andrew Norwell or a Eric Flowers or, you know, whatever, insert player that you wanted. Of course, like I, as a fan, you know, you'd like to see your team get a little bit better, but I'm not surprised they didn't make a move just because Brandon Bean, like you mentioned, we know he was working the phones, but he's not going to make a, a move for the sake of making a move. If a team's asking for too much for a player or more than he thinks that player's worth, he's not going to give it up. He's not going to give it up just for the sake of getting that player. And my guess is that's probably what happened is he probably called a couple teams, asked about a certain player. They probably are asking for way too much, and he just declined and moved on with his day. And what? And like, let's investigate that Rams thing a little bit before we move on. You know, Von Miller, he's got one. The Rams are not in a good cap spot right now. So let's say that they, they get Von, they have Von Miller and they don't win a Super Bowl. They're out of a second and a third round pick. And they probably can't afford to play Von Miller next year. Maybe, maybe they'll find, they'll find money somewhere. They'll play with stuff, but you're still out of a second, third round quarter, uh, second and third uh, round picks. And you have an aging cornerback. And one other point that I, that I brought up today was that look at Kansas and it all, when you win the Super Bowl, it all pans out, but let's look into a universe for a second, just for the sake of an ex- thought experiment and a, a, a universe where Jimmy Garoppolo doesn't overthrow Emmanuel Sanders in the Super Bowl and San Francisco wins the Super Bowl. And now the chiefs have a Frank Clark contract that they're paying $25 million a year for, which can really kind of be looked at as maybe part of the reason why their window is closing on them because they have a lot of money invested between him and Chris Jones. Chris Jones is fine, but Frank Clark is not playing good anymore. And they're paying him $25 million this year and next year. They can't really get out of it. So that also that move kind of gets ridiculed if they don't have that Super Bowl. And so these things are so, you know, football can be changed on on such, you know, one play like that. And it, it's about keeping that window open. So that, that is much as I'll harp on it. And I understand the frustration. I don't want to be one of these, those gatekeepers. I'd say, Oh, you can't be frustrated. It's okay to be frustrated, but just, I just understand that. I think Bean was, was trying it. And there's, I think there's probably legitimate reasons why he didn't make those moves. Right. Don't want to make a Jamal Adams move at the end of the day. And I think that's, there you go. That's another good example of a team. <laughs> who had a Super Bowl window and was way too desperate to get better and has thrown away their future effectively. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not upset that Bean didn't do anything. I would have liked to see something, but uh, like I said, if, if, if the move wasn't there to be made, then don't make it. Uh, but nonetheless, here we are. It's Jaguars week. Uh, this is the opponent we have on Sunday. The Jaguars have been, uh, you know, in the news for maybe a lot of the wrong things uh, so far this season, just with one win. Of course, with the Jags, it kind of starts with Trevor Lawrence, the first overall pick, who was kind of the golden boy coming out. Everyone was all excited about him. So far, Ryan, what have you seen from Lawrence? Have you, you know, ha, ha, has he shown some signs? Did he be something good? Ha, you know, has he looked like a rookie? Like, what? How would you say he's looked so far through? Uh, I believe eight games for the Jaguars. You know, I was going through and I haven't watched a whole lot of Trevor Lawrence or really even looked at his box score this year until we I prepped for this show. And I looked through it and I watched some games and I and looked through his box score and I'm like, oh, he's kind of having like a Josh Allen rookie year. And that might sound weird. Well, Ryan, he was supposed to be pro ready. He's been the first overall pick since he was in sixth grade. Sure, fine, that's understandable. 
but understand where he is. There's a reason Jacksonville had the number one overall pick in, in this draft. It's because they were bad. Urban Meyer doesn't seem to really be helping the situation that much with his coaching either. So you, so you look at some of his numbers. He's completing 59% of his passes. He's at 6.3 yards per attempt, which I don't know where that ranks him, but the, that kind of number generally puts you around last place in the league. He has nine picks, but seven of those came in the first three games for what it's worth. Uh, in the first two games, or and seven came in the first two games. Seven of them, no, seven of them came in the first three weeks. Five of them came in the first two weeks. Um, he hasn't had a passer rating above 100 yet. But you know, to Jacksonville's credit, which is not a whole lot to 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 uh, kind of there isn't too many compliments you can give this coaching staff. But if you want to give something a compliment, they're letting him figure it out. He's thrown the ball a ton, and maybe part of that's because they've been trailing a ton. But he's thrown the ball over 40 times in almost every game. And he's thrown the ball over 50 times in, in two games. So they're really letting him figure it out. And I really like that. And I've cut, you know, just I've really come to appreciate teams that say, hey, you're you're our quarterback of the future. We're putting you in year one. You're gonna make some interceptions, you're gonna make some mistakes. Go figure it out. Go find out what you can and cannot do. And when you watch Trevor Lawrence play, it that's what it seems like right now. He's figuring out as a pro. What throws can he make? What throws can he make? Uh, how to operate in an offense? And man, he's talented. Like I, I think the box score. There's so much stuff out there about this class. Oh, it's terrible. You know, everyone was supposed to be so good in this class, and Mac Jones is looking like the best. No, Trevor Lawrence is. If you watch him, he is talented. People talk. You know, people talk about Josh's rookie year. Well, he numbers weren't good, but he flashed, and I saw things. That's Trevor Lawrence this year. Yeah, his numbers aren't good. But every once in a while, you'll you'll hit a throw, and I'm like, oh shit! Like no one, there's maybe five guys in the world that he can hit that throw. So he's he's developing. Numbers aren't great, but you know he he's talented, and I, I think at some point he's going to have one of those games where it clicks. Yeah, Trevor Trevor Lawrence, I think, is definitely a guy where you see the ceiling. You see how bright his future is. And I agree with you. I think if he was on a on a better team than Jacksonville, I mean, even like the Bears, I think you would see a totally different Trevor Lawrence. Uh, he just on, I mean, he's kind of in a wasteland right now in Jacksonville. And hopefully, you know, for his sake, things do get figured out there and that he can turn into the passer that we think he, he can be. But I agree with you, Ryan. I mean, he has been a little Josh Allen like, which let's be real. I mean, Josh Allen's rookie year it wasn't like they didn't beat anybody. I mean, they beat the Vikings, you know, in, in Minnesota that year, you know, Josh Allen, maybe Tennessee, well, you know, they beat Tennessee, like Josh Allen still won them some games and Trevor Lawrence could do the same. I mean, yes, they only have one win. It was against the dolphins and it came on a last second field goal. And I, I get that. Um, but Jacksonville does have a couple of good players. And one guy in particular that I think I'm going to keep my eye on just because he's the type of guy that has given the Bills some troubles in the past, including this past week is a guy like Marvin Jones, who's a big physical receiver who can go up and get it and is very strong at that catch point. We saw what Devontae Parker did to, to this team in that first half. We've seen what, you know, A.G. Brown has done to the Bills this year. You know, yes, Marvin Jones maybe isn't on that caliber, but don't get it twisted. Marvin Jones is a really good receiver still, despite the fact he's kind of been forgotten about over the last couple of seasons. And he's a guy that Trevor Lawrence, I mean, relies on heavily. I mean, that's the leading receiver so although yes, he'll be on Trey White, but I mean, I I I gotta think that Trevor Lawrence is gonna be throwing the ball that way a couple times at least in this game. Yeah, I mean, I like the Jacksonville pass catcher group. Both him and Lavisca Chenault are having decent years for for what this offense relative to to this offense. If Chenault's a guy who's who's an up and comer who I think maybe the bill would have been a bill if they hadn't uh, drafted or have they hadn't traded for Stephon Diggs in 2019 or 2020 and Marvin Jones is an experienced guy. He's, I really like that signing for them because they did something that Buffalo didn't do when they had Josh, which was give him some experienced receivers. Josh had Andre, what was it? Andre Holmes, Zay Jones and Jeremy Curley, Jer Jeremy Curley. And it, so he has some experienced pass catchers. They have Jamal Agnew. Who's fast. They have a guy that I think we both really liked. At least I really liked in the free agency process and Dan Arnold, who they traded for came in and had a pretty decent game last week or they're not last week, two weeks ago, he had 68 yards in their first game with him. And when he started, 
I think he's a guy with remarkable upside who is almost kind of like Mike Gesicki, that he's a kind of basically a wide receiver in a tight end body and could potentially be a problem in this game, even though he's only had a couple games. And, you know, there's all the, as a whole, you know, their numbers aren't great, but there's some playmakers on the Jacksonville offense that I think even, you know, the guy that I, I'm going to put as my, as a player to talk about later, but James Robinson, who, as we talk right now, uh, is day to day, came out as day to day today, but he was an undrafted guy who I think put up like 1,500 yards was the number last yeah, year. I think, he, I think he was second in, in, in rushing in the, in, in the league. Which is wild to me that they went out and they drafted a quarter a running back in the first round after the they made a wonderfully smart decision in finding immense value in a running back in undrafted who was really good and they're like oh let's do the opposite of that and draft one in the first round. <laughs> it, it, I don't understand that, but James Robinson's a good guy. They have not terrible offensive linemen. You know we talk about I mean Andrew Norwell obviously Juwan Taylor's had experience in this league and some starts. Right. So they have Cam Robinson, one of those guys who's kind of been around, and he's not a super plus plus player, but he's good. So this this offense, this isn't an offense. This isn't like going. This isn't like Texans offense where it was like, who's that? No, they have some. They have some players who can be problematic if put in the right situations. And don't forget, they have tight end one, Jacob Hollister, too. I mean, fine. I can't believe <laughs> you let him go. I mean, come on. <laughs> and Ty, no. Jacob, revenge games are who knows? Revenge games are real. I'm a, I'm a big believer in revenge games, so who knows? Right, right. So, yeah, no, but this offense does have a couple good players. They even have I – I don't know if he's hurt or not. I honestly um, – can't remember. They also have G, uh, DJ Chark, who's a guy who actually is. Oh, yeah, DJ Chark. I don't know about DJ right. Chark. Right. They they have him, and he's a big play guy. So, no, this offense has got to playmaking ability. I just think they've been held back from, you know, horrible coaching, frankly, from Urban Meyer and that offensive coaching staff, which uh, have kind of been a bunch of guys that were on top echelon NFL teams that those head coaches kind of gave up on. I think they have, like, Brian Schottenheimer is their OC, who's Chark I don't know how by the way, Char- Sharks and I are oh, Sharks and I are okay. Yeah, I, I thought he was hurt, but uh, yeah, I think they have Sean Heimer as their OC, who's just kind of been around forever and has never kind of his prime sort of has passed. So I do think that's kind of what's held them back. But you know, Sean McDermott's been very, very successful against rookie quarterbacks. I actually think the only time a rookie quarterback has beaten Buffalo, I believe, was Sam Darnold. Darnold's you know when the, the, that 2018 season. I think that was the only time a rookie yep. QB's ever beaten McDermott in the Bills. So. You have to think that they will throw some stuff at Trevor Lawrence that he's never seen before. Uh, you know, when you look at this defense, Ryan, is there anybody that kind of sticks out to you as, as someone could be problematic? I think this is where the Jaguars have really been atrocious as their defense has been pretty much a train wreck and they don't have a lot of real impact guys. But is there at least someone who you think could maybe cause a few issues for the Bills? Well, I'm glad you asked because I've been looking forward to this all week. Josh Allen. On the Jaguars, he is he was a high first round pick a couple years ago. He he's been a he's a guy who can cause problems. This year he has, I have his sack numbers. This year he has uh, four and a half sacks already. He had ten and a half sacks as a rookie. He's a, a really a, a dominant dominant player for this team. And we talk about guys who could ruin game plans or who have ruined game plans. You know, it's never really been a secondary guy. It's never really been linebackers who guys who ruin games for Buffalo. And I guess really any quarterback are, are defensive linemen and TJ Watt kind of ruined that Saints or the, not the Saints game, the, the Steelers game for us. You know, you want to tell yourself a story. You want to you want to look into a scenario where the Bills have a hard time winning this game, or even you know they pull an upset. I think it's not it's well within the realm of possibilities that Josh Allen, the defensive end, has a really big day. And you know, I don't want to see Josh Allen get sacked, but it would be funny seeing the stats, the the the, the box score after the game that Josh Allen sacked Josh Allen. Yeah, I also wrote down Josh Allen for a guy that I'm keeping an eye on just because I think he's kind of the only guy in their defense that would put that puts real fear into me. I think that, you know, Miles Jackson guy is kind of past his prime at this point. Uh, they don't really have anyone that's secondary that's too good. Um, 
This is so the worst. I, de- this is the worst defense will play by DVOA this year. They're thirty second. Oh, in absolutely, DVOA. absolutely. No, the Jaguars defense stinks. Um, but tre- but but like you said, the Josh Allen's good, and and they line him up everywhere too. He's not just exclusively the edge guy. They'll they'll put him in coverage. They'll run him. They'll blitz him up the middle. They'll you know they'll obviously put him on the end. I mean, he really is kind of a versatile pass rusher that can do it all. And he's a guy that that, that you know the Bills are going to know where he is because, like you mentioned, he is probably the only game wrecker on that defense but he is a game wrecker i mean i listen i know this is going back his college days and i remember when kentucky played penn state in a bowl game uh that you know josh allen's last year in college and he dominated them so i i mean i've seen in my own eyes just how kind of special he can be at times um but listen i mean you got to think that the bills are going to know that that's the guy they need to block that's the guy they need to make sure they know where you know is accounted for and hopefully they have a game plan to be able to keep our Josh Allen clean from their Josh Allen. Yeah, that, I, I'm, so, I'm, I'm just looking forward to seeing that. I, I want to, I'm, <laughs> I'm excited to see how I think Catalan's on the call again this year. So I'm, ex- I'm excited yeah. to see what Catalan does with that. I hope they do a Jersey swap. So they both hold up Jay Allen jerseys <laughs> just from different teams. I think that would be, that'd be kind of funny. We'll see. So as we kind of wrap things up here, Ryan, of course, this is kind of probably the moment I'm sure everyone's been waiting for score predictions for this game. I believe the Bills are 14 point favorites in this game at the moment. I don't know if that line has changed from Vegas, but I, I can actually check right here. And it is sorry about that. Yep, the Bills are 14 points, 14 point favorites according to Vegas. So, Ryan, do they cover? What's the score in this game? What do you predict? I have a hard time seeing how a defense as bad as Jacksonville stops the Bills offense with any sort of regularity in this game. And then you said it uh, before that Trevor Lauren, you know, rookie quarterbacks have a really hard time against Sean McDermott. And as talented as I think he is, and the next big thing is that I, I think he is, and is as uh, as what's competent as some of these pass catchers and as some of the skilled players on this offense are, I just think they're, it's going to be really hard for them to move the ball. So I think this is a, a blowout of massive proportions. I'm going 40, 21 and we'll, we'll see. I think we'll see Mitch Trubisky pretty early in this game this week. Yeah, I think I, I'm someone who is a big believer that like NFL games, a lot of times come down to coaching and let's be honest. Sean McDermott is a top 10, potentially maybe even top five head coach in the national football league. And urban Myers probably bottom four, uh, when it comes down to it, if you were to rank the head coaches. And I just think that Sean McDermott just completely schools this urban Meyer offense and just shuts them, shuts them down. And like you said, you know, a defense that, that right now DVOA is dead last in the NFL and doesn't really have a hell of a lot of talent. I agree with you. I think this is going to be a pretty easy win for Buffalo. I have the winning 42-16. I just don't think this game is going to be competitive pretty much from the start and from the end. I think Bills Mafia can kind of just relax, enjoy the game, watch some Trubisky, uh, you know, maybe throw in some dimes to Kumro or something like that. I don't know, but I, I don't think this is going to be a game that fans should be worried about too much. I hope it's a game that I can switch on the red zone by like the third and a half quarter or something like that. Yep. Yep. Or- yeah. Cause we always, we always miss that one o'clock witching hour with the bills games, which is a little unfortunate because I'm a big witching hour guy. I don't know about you, Ryan, but I, I love when that end of all the one o'clock games are coming and, and you just get bounced around a great ending after great ending. Yeah. When you, when you get a good, when you get a good, uh, when you have a good set of ending games, it's always enjoyable to uh, enjoyable to watch. Right. Absolutely. So that about does it here for the five, eight, five report. Again, thanks to you. Thank you guys for listening so much. We appreciate uh, your support. Please check out all the other good stuff going on at the F. Follow us on Twitter. Um, and with that being said, for Ryan Sullivan, I'm Mitch Broder. Thanks for listening. Have a great rest.